What's up, you guys? Welcome back to the Contractor Marketing Show. I'm your host, Matt Tebow, and today I'm really excited for the guests that we're having on today's show. We have Stephen Bousquet. He is the president at Lawn Science, and he's also a partner at Green Profit Academy. What's going on, Steve? How you doing today, Matt? Thanks doing for awesome, pronouncing man. my name right. I appreciate that. I can yeah, tell a French, French Canadian. I struggle from the same exact problem, so I get, I get the, uh, I get the struggle. Um, dude, I'm really excited to have you on today's podcast. I'm gonna label today's podcast something like, you know, cash flow marketing, um, understanding your numbers with marketing. I'm not entirely sure yet what the title is gonna be, but I, you know, the the topic of today that we're really gonna dive into is knowing your numbers and being able to um, make calculated decisions on your marketing based off of understanding those numbers. Um, so before we dive into like your story and a lot of the really good advice that you're gonna give to a lot of contractors listening right now, um, maybe just first give us a high level overview of Green Profit Academy and what the work is there that you guys do. Absolutely, so Green Profit Academy, was formed by myself and Christine Era. Christine Era is a profit first professional at the mastery level. And uh, I had worked with a couple other profit first professionals and I could not get my numbers dialed in completely. And I started to work with Christine and the other profit first professionals, they were a bookkeeper and a coach. Christine is like a consultant, and she owns a bookkeeping uh, company, but she definitely operates at a little higher level. So she really helped my company dial in the, our profit first. And we were growing at that time, you know, 20, 25% a year. So having the money right where it needed to be at the time it needed to be there was crucial. And we and it helped us grow through that growing point. And instead of growing pains, it was a real opportunity and the money was always there. Um, so after working with Christine, I said, you know, we have to get this out to the rest of the green industry because I have owned a lawn and landscape business for 40 years. And uh, so uh, her and I are partners on the book and she wrote it. I was the industry expert. Um, you know, a lot of the numbers are real numbers from real contractors. Um, so we formed Green Profit Academy because I had struggled as a contractor for many years, how to make a profit, consistent profit, how much to take out of the business, how much to leave in. So a lot of that was painful. So the whole concept behind Green Profit Academy is to reduce the pain, you know, reduce the length of the learning curve, increase profitability quicker and sooner and help all contractors, you know, many contractors read the Profit First Lawn Care and Landscape uh, businesses who are not just in the lawn care and landscape business because it really lines out how much you should be spending, what you should be focusing on. Yeah. Wow. Really, really good. We're going to dive into like a lot of the specific stuff of like marketing and cash flow in a sec. But first off, I guess the first question I want to give. For maybe a contractor listening to this who hasn't dove really deep into that, why does this stuff matter? Like, why is this stuff important to really have a handle on? So the real reason is because we went in business for one reason. Mostly it is to take care of ourselves and our family and the people we love, right? I'm working with people who want to give their their whole family a better life. They're not trying to buy their third Ferrari or their, you know, third beach house. They these people are trying to give their family the best life they can give their families, whatever that means to them. And so it's important because we've made promises to people, you know, our mm -hmm. spouse, our family, in our community. And so if we can just kind of be more intentional about the numbers, you know, I grew up blue collar, you know, Blue collar people go to work. That's what we do. You're sick. You go to work. You don't feel good. You go to work. You're behind on your bills. You go to work. You work more often, longer, weekends, yeah. whatever it takes, right? The challenge with that, once you become a business owner, your mindset has to shift because we're not just a worker. We're running a business. We're running an asset, and it needs to be very intentional of how that's managed and run. Yeah. So well said. Um, so we're going to keep things kind of on track of like cash flow when it comes to marketing. Cause we could go really broad with this and go on all over place. 
but I think it would be really good first to start the conversation of like cash flow when it comes to marketing. I know you were talking earlier, like before we started this show, of something that you called, I think it was like bank balance marketing or something like that. Um, let's start there because I think, you know, just earlier this morning, I was having a conversation with a contractor and he was saying like, Matt, I want to work with you and do some marketing, but uh, a check that I just uh, received from a commercial job, it just bounced. And now I just realized that like, I don't have any marketing, like money for marketing because I have nothing in my bank account. So it's like just situations like that, I think you could speak really well to for this point. So dive into a little bit of that. So for lawn care and landscaping, especially for lawn applications, we really have about a 12 week window to sell the whole about 80% of the year's services. You're going to sell it. You're locking those people into a contract for the rest of the year. So it's really, you know, maybe the mid middle of March until the middle of May. So we're going to spend about 90% of the lawn care marketing budget in those 12 weeks. So every year before I started doing profit first, it would be this huge cash crunch because I had to pay all that advertising and all that marketing in that 12 week period. And of course we weren't saving up for it. And then when we shifted to profit first, the entirety of the year. So every single deposit, a very small percentage of that deposit is going into my marketing account. So when it comes to those 12 weeks, I've been saving up for that all year. So instead of pulling, trying to find all this cash in that, you know, three month period, I've been, yeah. I've been saving up for that all year round. And so I, I referred to that bank balance marketing because what happens is if we are not saving for it, we're not planning for it. Um, we, at, we do our marketing based on what's in our bank balance. Right. Yeah. And which ends up being cheap marketing. And, you know, I kind of joked about, you know, kind of, it's kind of like cheap marketing is like a cheap dentist, you know, <laughs> nobody wants to go find the cheapest dentist in town when you have need oral surgery or dental work done, you want the yeah. best dentist. Yeah. 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 Um, so basically is what you're talking about essentially, is it like putting together like a pre-planned budget that you have pre-planned and, and then you're putting that money away into like another account and that's like a marketing account. Is that kind of what you're saying? Exactly. So we have a marketing account. So there's yeah. going to be a percentage that goes in. It depends on your revenue. It depends on your business size. It depends on the maturity of your business. You know, so if you're just starting out in business, you're trying to build up your book, you know, your customer base, that percentage might be a little higher. Um, the percentage, you know, if you've been in business for 40 years and you've done 5,000 jobs, the percentage for new marketing or marketing to get new clients is going to be lower for a really mature business. But we spend about half of our marketing budget is going to be toward our existing and past clients and current clients. Yeah. Right. But if you're new, almost all of your marketing is going to be to get new yeah. customers. Yeah. 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 We get the question a lot where there'll be a lot or where contractors will ask us like, what percentage of my revenue should I be spending on marketing? And typically what I'll tell them is I, I'll say something along the lines of what you said. It's like, well, you, in this case, you're a fairly new business. So nobody knows who you are. So maybe that percentage is going to be like higher than it would be for someone who's been in business for 25 years. And they're not maybe looking to scale. They kind of just want to maintain what they have. What's your take on that too? Like, is there a specific percentage or is that like a very um, personal thing that that's determined? Like, I'm curious of your mindset for that. So the whole thing is like, what is your average job size? What is your average gross profit margin on that job? How many of those do you need to sell a year? Like, let's say you're doing bathroom remodels and a bathroom remodel could be anywhere between 15,000 on the low up to 50,000 and up on the high, right? So if you're trying to do a million dollars a year, you need to sell 20, $50,000 bathroom models right so how many leads do we need to generate you know that many jobs so if your closing ratio is 50 percent, you need you know 40 leads for that yeah. so 40 leads so how much is it going to cost you to generate 40 leads that is kind of i would reverse engineer it to that because it's we need the 40 leads almost regardless of what what it's going to cost us we need to get those 40 leads so that it really depends on your market. You know, New York City 
selling fifty thousand dollar jobs might be a lot easier than you know in in my market, which is a kind of blue collar town that I that I live in. Um, but maybe it wouldn't be, you know. So you really have to look at how many jobs you need to sell to hit your revenue goals. And yeah. your revenue goal is going to be based on how much money you need to live on. So, if, you know, if you're taking 10% of total revenue as your owner's comp, $100,000, you need to sell those, those $40,000, $50,000 jobs or $20,000, yeah. $50,000 jobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned like earlier too, like, you know, looking at your bank account to know how much you could spend on marketing. Obviously, I would say to me that would probably be maybe like a red flag of like not truly having like a system of like what you're talking about. What other like red flags would you say a contractor could use to self identify that? Okay, like maybe I don't know my numbers as well in my business. So a couple different things is if it takes a long time to put an estimate together, uh, that typically mm. means that they don't know their numbers really that well or uh, if their profit margin from job to job is inconsistent like you know if you're doing a certain style of job over and over again you know mm. you should have that gross profit margin uh, dialed in um and then gross profit margin below 40 percent. I, I always say that once your gross profit margin which is your total sale on the job minus materials and subs and minus the labor that it costs you if what's left over is below 40%, I say that that's like the smoke alarm because if it's below 40%, there's not enough margin left for profit and for overhead recovery. Um, so typically that, but another easier one to tell us, you have a hard time paying your vendors. You have a hard time paying your subs. You're always, I call it too much month at the end of the money, right? So yeah. like you need to sell this one job to make sure your truck payments cover or your equipment's payment co is covered. So then you, it's called the contractor trap. So then you start selling jobs at a discount to make the payment, but there's no yeah. margin and oh. it just becomes a repeat. So it's one thing if it's an event, but if it's a monthly trend, that's an indication that you they're, they don't know their numbers. Wow. Yeah. Um, something that's kind of like a little bit of a frustration on, on our end is we're doing all this marketing for companies and they'll be closing deals, but then they'll say, oh yeah, well, you know, I didn't really make that much profit on that job. I only made like some of them, like you were saying 40%, like some guys that like we work with, their margin is more like 20, 15% at times. Um, they're like doing remodeling. I don't know if that makes like a huge difference, um, but they'll say like, oh yeah, you know, I didn't make that much profit on this job or whatever. And so it's a little bit frustrating sometimes for us because it's like, you know, they're doing everything right and like they're calling the lead, selling the job, blah, blah, blah. But maybe they're just not pricing it properly for that, for it to actually make sense for them, like in that moment in time of being like, cool, like we generated all these leads and did this, but there's no money left over for this to actually be like a really profitable campaign. Like, I don't know. Can you speak a little bit to that too? Yeah, a lot of it is. Um... So I, and I fell into this. So everything that I'm sharing today, I've done wrong at least three times, if not more for years. So I've lived wow. it. Right. So a lot of it is the emotional selling. Like I really need this job. Mm -hmm. There's no man hours on the books. We don't have a very big backlog and people are most of the time, I would say 99% of the time when we start working with new client as a, you know, coaching client, their margins are, and markups are not enough. So markup mm -hmm. is like what you're marking it up to. So 50 to a hundred dollars, let's say you buy something for 50, you sell it for a hundred, that gives you a 50% margin. But mm. so they're not marking stuff up enough. They're only marking stuff up 10, 15, 20%. So if you're not marking up 50%, you'll never get to a 50% gross profit margin. So their markups is in margins are where they're missing it. And then the other thing, is you know travel time prep time load time mm -hmm. um all those little things you know an hour at the beginning of the day an hour at the end of the day right that's two hours a day if that's 10 hours for one guy two guys is 20 hours um you know that's over a thousand hours a year uh that you and it's a double dip because not only did you not get paid for that you had to pay somebody for that so yeah. 
it, it's a double dip. So really the two spots I see with the low pricing is they don't add enough hours into the job and they're not doing their markups and margins on their, on their material and subs. People, th mm. people, they want to mark up a sub 10 or 15 or 20%. Well, they're doing all the work, but you have the liability, you have the risk, you mm. have the management, you have the time, you have the responsibility. I mean, you're the one that regardless of what the sub does, you're left holding the bag at the end of the day. Yeah. I can already hear a contractor saying, well, well, that's great, Steve. Like, you know, mark up 50%, but like, I'm not able to sell a job for that much more. You know, I'm getting pushed back and blah, blah, blah. And in that situation, what I would say is that's where things like marketing and branding come in. Like that's where you should be positioning your company to be a company where someone's worth uh, willing to pay a little bit more, or maybe your sales skills need to be brushed up on. Like what, what, that's my advice. What would your advice be if someone was giving you that pushback? Yeah, it's the same thing. Uh, so I, I just had a company last week. They wanted to do a ton more marketing. They wanted to do all this stuff, but their close ratio was like 24%. Um, and it was a sales issue. It wasn't a, it wasn't a marketing issue. They have plenty of leads. They yeah. just couldn't run them quick enough um, because they didn't have enough systems. And they also emailed, they emailed the quote. And I just play along with me here. I'm going to, I'm going to do, this is what an email quote sales call sounds like. Ready? Silence, nothing. You know, if we're emailing, oh, I emailed yeah. it to him. I never heard back. So yeah. if you're listening to this podcast, and you want to make a lot more money. You set a phone appointment with the person and you don't email them to that quote to them till they're on the phone. I'm going to say, hey, Matt, we're on our four o'clock appointment today. Thanks for coming here. We're going to review the quote we're going to go over. I'm going to email that to you right now while we're on the phone. And while so it's waiting better. open, how you doing? Now you're going to open the email. Now we're going to go over it, right? That's selling. Emailing people quotes is emailing people quotes. It's where quotes go to die. Yeah. It's not selling. Yeah. And guess what the conversation is like? As soon as they get that quote through email, they're like, wow, honey, look at this. This is way too expensive. Let's go talk to that other guy and see if he can get us cheaper. And then now you're wondering why they're not talking to you anymore. Right. And if the uh, if only one of the couples one of the husband or the wife or the whoever the couple is only one of them was there they weren't they didn't get the whole narrative of what yeah. involved was involved in the job so they, they look at it and they make their own narrative up yeah. you know and the other thing is we always set the second appointment on the first appointment because yeah. this is how it goes if you want to cause strife in a marriage and and I'll, I'll go somewhere with this so i go to your house and you're like okay i want this done and that done i'm like okay i take the notes I'll get back to you with a quote. So then the guy's wife is like, when, oh, did he give you a quote? No, he's going to get back to me with a quote. When? Well, he didn't say. So a week goes by and the wife goes, did you call, can you call him? Oh, yeah, I called him, left a message. No call back. Or they called him back, said we're working on it. Now three weeks goes by. And now the wife is like, see, I can never count on you to do anything. I have to do everything myself. You don't even care about this house. So now not only are you the contractor who didn't get back to him, you're the marriage breaker. You're causing all this strife. So even uh, if they do hire you, you're never going to get hired again because you're the troublemaker contractor. It doesn't matter whether you're putting a bathroom yeah, well, in backyard or building a home. You don't want to be the troublemaker in a marriage. You just have like this negativity associated with you just because of the situation too. Yeah, it literally will cause people to have that stress hormone. Yeah. And so every time they hear your voice, it gets rewired stress. They talk to you stress. Oh so if you God. can make it easy to buy, you're like, oh, you're the guy who showed up on time. You're the guy who got me the quote when you said, now price is not as much of an issue because you're the guy that's making me look good. And I tell you what, there's one person I want to look good to, is to my wife. I want, I got this. I got it handled. I am the guy, you know, that now you're making me win. Love it. Um, I think something really good for us to kind of like maybe segue and close things off a bit would be, I don't want to put you on the spot, but maybe tell a little bit of a story of a contractor who came into like your system where they didn't have an idea of like cash flow, where they had all these warning signs that you were saying, like they couldn't pay their vendors, like it was, you know, chaos. And then them going through the 
stages that you guys teach and the process and then kind of the outcome from that, just so someone listening to this could maybe see a picture of the transformation that understanding your numbers and having a handle on your cash flow can actually have for not only their business, but their quality of life. Yeah. So we have a contractor in Texas and he came in, they were not making any money. And really, if it wasn't for some of those loans, special loans they'd given out and the COVID money, they would not even be in business right now. So they were not, we had to do a deep dive through their numbers. First thing is their books are not being kept professionally. So we had to get those cleaned up to even make sure we were getting the right data and information. And then it wasn't that hard. I mean, we start implementing profit first. I say it wasn't that hard. He had to do a lot of work, but his pricing was off. It was just wrong, right? So like he thought he was charging people. so much an hour, but when he tracked how many hours they were putting on the jobs, he was not getting that much an hour. Okay. Yeah. And they weren't marking up their materials to get 50% gross profit margin. They weren't marking up their subs. They were emailing their quotes. Mm. They weren't going to visit, you know, with people face to face or over the phone. So, right, face to face sales are the highest. Phone on the phone is the second highest. You know, one of the lowest is the email, and texting is even higher than emailing um, for sales. So that's one of the things. So starting on the profit first, which is really we start them off with just a profit account. Yeah. Because to try to roll the whole thing out. So here's the thing with profit is profit is what you get for owning the business, right? So a lot of times profit will be confused with net income. Net income is over on the on the PL, but that is the net income, right? After all the expenses that has a job, it has to pay the owner if it's in an LLC, it has to pay capital improvements, it has to pay any equipment. So people get that confused. But also the owner's pay is the pay the owner gets to run the company and do the work in the company. The profit is what the owner gets for owning the asset that is mm -hmm. the company, the asset and the equity. So we want to make sure we're making a profit. It's kind of like putting money in the bank. We want to make sure we get interest. So first off, we got to make sure that the owner's getting paid the, for what he's working in the business. And then the business is generating a profit. Um, so we want to make sure that that's what we're focusing on. So after we do the profit account, then we're going to do a material and sub account. So those we're kind of baby stepping into this instead of like do all this stuff. And then it scares people and they don't do anything. So we're kind of making steps and steps. So just getting the price right. So they, they were, they did about $2 million last year. This year we're going to do about 1.8 million and they're going to have a $250,000 net income, which, and it was zero last year. Whoa. So and Whoa. they're doing less work. <laughs> with fewer guys, fewer man hours, but they're getting paid for all the man hours that they're working. Wow. And their, the markup on the material is really, you know, they were really not making any margin on the material and they do sell a lot of material and they have subs. So now they were getting margin. So we're, we're still making improvements in that company. Um, they have too much overhead. Their marketing is ineffective. Um, so, you know, they were doing the marketing where they uh, kind of like, oh, we don't have any work. Let's throw all this money at it. And yeah. then, oh, we're too busy. Let's stop. And okay, that's yeah. not a good plan. Yeah. Wow, that's really cool. That is, um, that's a really cool example of like just getting more efficient. Because I think a lot of the times it's like these big revenue numbers can be kind of like a dick measuring contest a bit where it makes you feel like it feeds your ego, but at the end of the day, like you were saying, if you don't have any profit or anything left over, then it's like I'd much, much rather operate the 1.8 and actually bring home like a healthy profit margin. So like, that's really cool. How often do you see guys who are kind of like having that mindset of like the revenue, but then you go into their business and you see that there's like nothing left over. I'm sure that happens frequently. So in contracting, it's about 80% of the time. So most contractors wow. are really pass through entities. So the money comes in and money goes out. The, like there's almost yeah. no retained earnings. You know, they're just as fast as it comes in, it goes out. And it's, and that's typical because there's no plan for money. That's what money does. Because when wow. you, when you have no plan, 
that's what happens. And when you profit first, it starts to go, okay, this is when we pay bills. This is when the money comes in, the money goes into materials and subs, owner's comp, the tax account, OPEX, operating expenses, and then yeah. the, pro and the profit account. So now all the money has a job. It's like a toolbox. You yeah. don't just throw all your tools in the box. Your hammers go here. You know, your nail gun goes here. Your tapes go here. You don't just like throw it because the next time when you need that tape, you don't want to spend time trying to figure out where the tape is or your, your hammer, your air gun. I mean, you just, you need to know if you're going to be efficient. Awesome, man. Cool. Um, so I think this was a great conversation. Uh, it's been super awesome, like learning and talking a little bit deeper about this. Honestly, I feel like we could go like really deep and go like into, you know, much more about this. But if there was kind of anything maybe to tie the loop on this, a nice bow, you know, for a contractor to walk away from this podcast being like, okay, like I learned that one thing from Steve and that was actually really helpful for most contractors. What would you say is kind of the one thing you could leave them with after this conversation? The one thing is um, to be in, anticipate what's going to happen, right? We know that we're going to have to do marketing next year. So what's the number going to be and how are we going to save for it? And who is our customer and who do we like to work with and how many jobs do I need to sell? So ask yourself some questions because if you're going to be in business for the next 20 years, they're going to be the same questions every year. And so, you know, those are the things like anticipate what's going to happen every year that is giving you a challenge. And uh, also, you know, get coaching. Uh, you're not alone. A lot of us in contracting, we feel we're alone. We're the only person going through this. But, you know, 90% of small businesses are going through the same exact thing. And yeah. um, so it's good if you can meet and talk with people who can help you move along that learning curve. And the other thing I see is people, I'm smart. I felt the same way. I'm smart enough to figure this out on my own. I'm smart enough, you know, I can work harder. And uh, it just, there are other people like, hey, this is the path. This is the light, you know, come over here. So read, get some help and uh, ask good questions. That's awesome, man. And on that note, like if someone wanted to get help from you personally and work with you guys professionally, like where would they go? How do they reach out to you? So you can reach out to us at greenprofitacademy.com. That's greenprofitacademy.com. You can uh, Google search me. You can, if you search me on YouTube or Green Profit Academy on YouTube, we have almost 100 videos on online going over all these different subjects. Uh, you can reach us also on our podcast, Green Profit Academy Pros Podcast. And uh, we're also, uh, you can find us on Facebook at Green Profit Academy or Profit First for Lawn Care Professionals. Lawn Care, Profit First for Lawn Care and Landscape Businesses. Yeah. Awesome. I'll, I'll drop the links in the description so anyone listening to this, they can go check that out. Um, Steven, thank you so much for being on the show today, man. Really, really nice catching up with you. Really, really valuable information for a lot of contractors. So thanks for being on the show today. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you, Matt.